Today is October 6, 2022, and my guest is author Ryan Holiday. This is Ryan's fourth appearance on Econ Talk. He was last here in October talking about his book, Stillness is the Key. Our topic for today is his latest book, Discipline is Destiny, The Power of Self-Control. Ryan, welcome back to Econ Talk. Yeah, I guess this would have been October 2019, right? So a, a couple of things have happened between <laughs> then and now. A little bit, yeah. Uh, th- let's start by, uh, this book is part of a series. Yeah. So tell us about that series. Well, I'm doing a series now on the cardinal virtues. The, the I guess, coincidence, it's not even a coincidence, but one of the, the quirks of history is that uh, Stoicism and Christianity have the same cardinal virtues. Uh, courage, self-discipline or temperance, justice, and wisdom. And so I am in the midst of a, a four-book series. I did Courage uh, first. This is the book on self-discipline, and now I am knee deep uh, on on the book about justice, and then wisdom. I'm intimidated enough about that I have not yet begun to think about, but uh, that looms there in the future. I just want to mention. We'll come back and talk to it later about it later, maybe. But you're a back to back to back to back kind of guy. Um, I, I would recommend a break yeah. before you work, tackle the wisdom book. But uh, I'm happy to hear that that book three is is in pro- in process. You know, I it, there was actually a sort of a debate on both on discipline and on justice about whether the disciplined thing was to push forward or to pull back. Uh, yeah. And I was very certain on, on discipline. I was. I, I there was there's sort of a dark night of the soul moment where I thought I wasn't going to be able to do it and I was going to push it and then a, as I was starting justice I was like you know what I'm definitely going to do it but both times I ended up having sort of a breakthrough and then getting really excited about it and liking it but but uh I I am I think it, when I was younger the idea of deliberately waiting on something was inconceivable to me and I I do think I've gotten it, at least to the place where I could entertain the idea well, I think you have a precept in this book called Wait for the Sweet Fruit. <laughs> yes. I guess, but some of us have the characteristic that all fruits seem sweet to us or sweet enough. All ideas are right, right? Yeah. I mean, and for people who don't know, the sweet fruit is is patience or or uh, patience is, uh, they say, is a... Uh, it, it, it is bitter, but the fruit is sweet. The the results, the patience is hard, but what you get on the other side of patience is wonderful. And I think that's probably generally true for the concept of restraint as well, which is it feels hard as you're resisting doing something or holding back from doing something. But usually, you know, the what comes on the other side of that waiting or you know, dialing in the exact right opportunity. You, usually the the rewards for that are, are worth it. It's just hard. It's hard in the moment when you are forgoing something. May I ask how old you are, Ryan? I uh, I turned 35 this year. You look 21 or 18. So those watching on YouTube will will agree with me. But my, I, I want to, before we get to the book, I'm curious whether you feel that in the writing of this book, you gained any discipline hmm. and whether in the arc of your life so far, uh, whether you feel you've gotten better at discipline. That's a good question. I, I would say that of the cardinal virtues, discipline is the one that I feel most comfortable talking about as opposed to feeling like it's the, the a re, you know, when you're writing about courage, it's this, obviously it's a sensitive topic because the, the courage of the sort of greats of history is so profound, transcendent in some cases that it feels almost uh, insulting to even talk about it as if you could instruct. So so uh, this is the book that I felt most comfortable writing. Uh, so I, as I feel like I am a disciplined person, I feel like discipline is a strength of mine. But I, I definitely feel like I, I grew from the book, even just what we're talking about, the idea that, you know, discipline isn't always doing, sometimes discipline is not doing. You know, I think the journey that I've tried to be on, and I, I feel like I've gotten better with each project, uh, this one uh, being a big step in that direction, is how do you, <clears throat> how do you do something at a high level, be disciplined about it without it coming at the expense 
of discipline in other areas of your life or or even just your ability to be present and show up for other elements of your life. I think it, it, it's much simpler to say, hey, I'm going to dedicate myself fully to this thing and be very disciplined about it. But uh, my family would suffer or my health would suffer or my reading would suffer. You know, I, I so I feel like trying to integrate the as being on this track of doing, you know, books very consistently or year in and year out, I've had the, the excuse of, sorry, I can't, or, hey, I apologize, it's, I, you know, for my lack of temper or, or, or sorry, my lack of patience or my temper or whatever. Um, it becomes harder to justify when you're always doing the thing. You don't get the excuse of, hey, I'm on a book deadline or I'm in the middle of writing a book when you're always doing that thing. You know, it's like if you're an actor and you're like, sorry, I'm grouchy. I'm on this crazy diet for this role that I'm doing. Um, you know, you can use that excuse occasionally, but if you are always doing that, people go, look, you got to figure out how to integrate this into your life. So do you think you've gotten better at that over much, not just writing the book? I mean, just in general. Well, I would say much better. Um, Actually, as I was finishing up uh, discipline, my my oldest was sort of sitting at the kitchen table, and he was, uh, you know, like doing some art project or something. And I was sitting on the couch. I guess it, this would have been he would have expected me not to be sitting on the couch, but to be right, you know, to be at the office. And he said, you know, um, Dad, I'm sorry you lost your job writing books. And I, and, <laughs> and and I was like, wait, what? What are you talking about? And I realized, like, in his mind, things were normal enough that uh something had obviously changed at work um mm. and uh you know obviously that was very sweet but also sort of a retroactive indictment of how things had been in the past so i i think i have gotten better at it i've tried i'm i guess i'm trying to just normalize it in and and by that i don't mean make my life crazy so the abnormal work that i do seems normal but to try to get to a place where hey i show up at the office and i do you know a few hours of my thing and then i'm you know i'm not i'm not in this sort of adrenalized uh you know frenzy or sprint that can sometimes be the the creative process but it's just it's just a part of life. And I, I feel like I've gotten closer to that, although not perfect at it. At, at one point in your book, you say that um, discipline is contagious. Yeah. And I think uh, I'm very sympathetic to that idea. I, I had not thought about it. But if you had asked me, uh, where where did I get my disease from <laughs> um, of of uh, to the extent I'm disciplined or I would say more uh, achievement oriented or something mix in there, some kind of mix in there. I'd have to think about it. Um, you know, obviously I got some of it from my father. I got some of it from my best teachers. Uh, and certainly there are other people in my life who've inspired me uh, who are not in my field. But I'm curious if you can point to one or two people that, you think of as your um who gave you this discipline who inspired you yeah my my father definitely worked very hard my father had you know sort of worked multiple jobs he was a police uh he was a police detective and then he also sold real estate on the side so he, he all and then he, he was an investor so my dad was always sort of doing multiple things and so i think the ability to to, to sort of manage a portfolio of activities or pursuits. I, I think I, I sort of learned by osmosis through my dad. Um, but when I, when I uh, left college, I was a, a research assistant for Robert Greene, who I think is one of the sort of great nonfiction authors of our time. And Robert is one of those people that is very monk-like in their discipline. You know, he, he sort of, first off, he basically only does that, like, he, he's uh, he's just a writer, and I mean that in in the complimentary sense. He's he is an artist who is committed to the discipline of what he does, and uh, you know has very strong boundaries about the work. Sort of won't answer the phone at certain times. You know you can't drop in and just say hello. He's he's sort of monk like in his commitment to these books, and 
And he's one of those authors that will work, you know, several years on a single book. So he and I are different in that sense. But I think that was meeting someone who one of the one of the most important things that can happen, I think, as you're starting down a career path is to meet someone who's like a pro at that thing. Um, obviously, anyone who's getting paid is a professional, but when you meet someone who is just like fully committed and uh, ritualized and organized about what they do, they they treat it like a discipline. I think that's just a very powerful, transformative thing because you realize, oh, there's there's sort of the wavelength that people who are just getting by are on, and then there's the the pursuit of mastery in that profession and which one of those are you going to be? Yeah. When I was talking earlier, um, you know, I made it sound like we're talking about a workaholic situation, which I think both of us have a little bit of for sure, but it's really, it's a subtler thing that we're talking about, which is, I I think it's having great expectations for oneself. Um, that you don't take life casually. That comes at a very fierce price, I, I think. I don't know if you agree with that. Your book is, um, it is. I hope you don't take this as an insult. I, it's a compliment for me. Yeah. I, I saw your book as a pep talk. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I'll have more to say about that. But, but pep talks are generally about devotion is the way I would say it. And that's sort of what you're talking about, being a pro, somebody who's devoted to mastery. And I have some degree of that disease or blessing, whatever you want to call it. It's not clear which it is. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other, I guess. Um, but I want to make clear that's it's not just that you feel like you have to work a lot. It, it has to do with what your expectations are for yourself. And to me, the, dis, the whole idea of discipline and self-control is that you don't take the craft of forming yourself casually. I think that's right. It's, especially it's like you can be a workaholic because it's coming from a place of insecurity. You could be a workaholic because you're running from something. You could be a workaholic because all you want is money, right? To, I think what we're talking about here is when you have decided that you have some sort of calling and you you th- there's a, a purpose to what you're doing and you don't you don't take it lightly. And and maybe if like if you're thinking about it in sports, there's there's obviously people who are naturally talented who like fame who like the rush of the crowd who 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 are they're, they're very good and this is why they're at an elite level and then you know then there's your Tom Brady's right who who have decided that there is something you know beautiful or artistic about the the game and they they want to sort of reach that transcendent level in in that respect you also need the ability to be disciplined about your discipline right like to to not take your commitment to that thing too far at the expense of everything else. But I, I I think it does start with some sort of idea that this is not just a job. This is a means of, well, this is, this is a thing from which meaning can be derived and there is some sort of purpose to what you're doing beyond the compensation or the, the, the external rewards. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk about practice. Uh, yeah. you, you have a, a section on practice. And when I interviewed Tyler Cowan about his book, Talent, he suggested as an interview question, which I found surprising and I still some, do somewhat, you should ask people, what do they practice? What, what do they try to get better at? And um, I understand that for a musician. I understand it for um, an athlete. I sometimes understand for a teacher, Doug Lamov here has, has argued that that practice is crucial to being a great teacher. It, there are many crafts in which practice is useful. Um, do you practice? Is there practice in your life? I do. And, and you know, it's actually funny. In the practice chapter, I, I had a whole section that was written about Tyler and this question that he asks. I ended up moving it to the wisdom book. But he says, you know, how, how do you that's, practice? That's the book. That's the book you haven't started yet? Well, yeah, yeah. well, Go ahead. Th- this is this goes. This actually it actually does relate to my practice. Now that I think about it, so um, you know, he talks about like his question is, how do you practice your scales? Right, a musician goes through the scales. You go over and over and over again, and it, be, it sort of gets in- imbued into your muscle memory. 
and also inspiration, connection, ideas come from this sort of repetitive practice of the thing. Um, writing is unusual in that the practice, uh, the, writing, writing is strange to find one's practice. And I, I ultimately made the decision, as I was saying, to think that that question of what is your practice to me is the domain of wisdom, the actual act of doing it would be the self-discipline. So it's hard to, I think, sometimes distinguish between where one virtue begins and the other ends. For me, the, the, the building block of what I do, and I think the form of practice is I read and then I break down the books that I, I've read on, onto note cards. I use physical four by six note cards. So yeah, we've I, talked about this on Econ Talk in a, in, I think in a past episode. I think yeah, we, so. So like these, this section here, these are books that I've read who I have not gone through and done uh, the note cards on. So I'm a, I'm a little behind in my practice, but to me, like I know that I am getting better at what I'm doing. I'm practicing the discipline when I am actively reading and going through the note cards. So like right now I'm in the middle of writing uh, this book. So that is doing the act, but the, the building blocks of that are a lagging in like the, the the stack of note cards is a lagging indicator as to whether I have been doing the practice. And if I get too caught up with speaking or podcasts or writing six months from now, I'll see the consequences of not having done the active practice. The, the other part for me that's, that's been a sort of a, wasn't intentional, but it's been very, very helpful is I started this daily email in 2016 called the Daily Stoic, where I send out one email about Stoic philosophy every day. And so I don't do that every day in the sense that I wake up and write today's email because that wouldn't, part of discipline is about setting up systems that allow you to effectively do what you do. If I had to wake up every day and do it in real time, that would be, I think, immensely inefficient. But I have to produce enough raw material on a regular basis to, to, to fill this daily email. So having this thing that I have to ship every single day keeps me in shape in the way that I think uh, is similar to the function of practice. So I'm going to challenge you. Okay. Not gonna, it's not going to be pleasant. <laughs> Maybe. We'll see. Um, I think you are the, the thing you just described, it, there, there's two kinds of practice. There's two uses of that word in the English language, probably more than two, but the two I want to focus on. One is to work at a craft in a repetitive way in, the, in seeking improvement. Yes. The, the other is to have a regular disciplined activity that um, you commit to. So you certainly have the second, and, and that's the reading of the books and the taking of the notes. I don't know if there's any anybody – here's the complimentary part. I don't know if there's anybody as good at this as you are. Um, your books are full of phenomenal stories. They are uh, – the quotations are spectacular. You have a an ability to pull those together in a book form. I'm sure there are people who do it m maybe nearly as good as you, maybe as good. I don't know them. So I would just say you, well, you're in a class by yourself in the modern uh, nonfiction space in, in doing that. There are people who pull on, you know, stories. I did that in my recent book. I have a few things I've read and, you know, I've put them in the book. Uh, you have – this book I'm sure could have been three times as long. Yes. And you could have had had even more – most of these people are not particularly obscure. There are a couple obscure ones. We're going to get to them. But – but you could have had more obscure stories about people we don't know. They're amazing. You have an extraordinary um, reach, and it comes from your incredible discipline as a reader doing what you're talking about. And so that's an incredible practice. But I'm not sure that you practice at becoming a better writer. So, for example, and this is the, the hard part. I'm going to beat yeah. you up a little bit here. But that's because I like you, Ryan. And, yeah, and I'm very curious. I think you can take it. Um I did an interview with Penny Lane, the documentarian, on Kenny G. Kenny G is – he's not my cup of tea, yeah. but he's beloved. He's a master. And he, 
He's a master. He's mastered a part very particular craft, and he does it um, – I was going to say he does it effortlessly. That's not true at sure. all. He practices relentlessly to make it look effortless. Your books have a similar uh, um, effortlessness about them. It looks like – you could, you just sat down, and, and in a week or two, you just – you just spooled this out because it's – your writing sure. is extremely accessible, which I view as a huge plus. Um, not everybody does, but it's a, fan, it's a fantastic skill. Could you do better? And, and, and I say that because your next two books – it's a series, so I'm going to forgive you for this. The next two books will be like this but about different things, I assume. Yeah. They will have similar inspiring stories, phenomenal um, quotations – great life lessons. And we'll talk in a minute about why I think those are so important. But maybe you could do it in a more poetic way. I mean, could you get better at it? And should you? And one answer would be, of course not. Kenny G would never. I mean, I, I challenge Kenny G, like he's listening, uh, that he could get out of his comfort zone. You're in a credible comfort zone. It's not totally comfortable because it is an enormous amount of work. I understand that. But have you thought about doing something different? Yeah, I mean, that is the question is like, how how can one get better at a craft like writing? Um, obviously, as you said, you can do what you do over and over and over again, and it becomes sort of more intuitive and natural and and hopefully effortless. And I, I do think like if you look at uh, The Obstacles Away, which is in a similar format to Discipline is Destiny, as is Ego is the Enemy, Stillness is the King, Courage is Calling. So, so that's like five, you know, five books in this style. Mm -hmm. um, is the fifth one better than the first one? I would say absolutely. I, I would say that the, the practice does get better the more you do it. How, but how does one get better overall at writing? How would one even judge if one's getting overall better at writing? I, I, I feel like I have a practice where I do this where so one, uh, I don't do it as much anymore, but for many years, I also ghost wrote projects. So I would take on uh, projects for other writers. And I felt like, uh, obviously, in, in Discipline and Destiny, I talk about what's the main thing. You know, you need to be committed to the main thing. I, I justified these projects in two ways. One, uh, they were economically rewarding. And so that gave me more creative freedom and security to pursue my own projects. But two, I felt like they were giving me reps or stage time, but practicing differently. One, one of the interesting yeah. lines in meditations, Marcus Aurelius talks about using the reins of his horse with his non-dominant hand. He's talking, he says, you get better from the practice of doing it differently. And so I would argue that part of the reason that, you know, book one through book five, there is an evolution there. It's not just that I did that same thing five times, but I also was working on extracurricular activities that made me a better writer. And uh, so I think there was that. And then I, I have, I feel like I've, and I'm not trying to just like explain away your criticism, but I did this book conspiracy, which I think was very different compared to my other books. Yeah, I love that book, and I think well, we you. talked about it. It's a, it is a spectacularly different book, and you did it on the surface effortlessly. It's a phenomenal book. It's like well, you can't you. put it down. Can't and, put and it down. I, I was actually just talking to my agent this morning, and he was basically like, "The publisher will fall over themselves to purchase another book in the vein of the books that you just did." And you know my. Uh, my thinking was, I'm not sure I want to do that. I was thinking about what what, I, what haven't I done and might I try to do something very different to get better at the thing. So uh, I, I'd like to think I am challenging myself in the way that you're talking about, but I would say that the, it's hard because when you're really good at something, it's easy to just continue doing that thing and you and get improving less- it yeah. yeah, and improving it marginally. I don't know, but marginally it sounds like an insult. It's not. Yeah. Getting better at something that's phenomenal is hard and important. You have a big fan base. You have a lot of people who like this kind of book. And and that's again, going back to Kenny G. Kenny G shows up and does um Miles Davis. It, it's gonna his fans are gonna boo him and, and walk out angry, right? And I'm yeah. not suggesting you do Miles Davis. I, I personally, given your talent 
And given how much I like the the conspiracy book, which we talked about on Econ Talk in 2018, and I'm not hurt that you don't remember because I'm sure you talked to a lot of people about that book. <laughs> this is a great book. Um, it just I, I'd love to see you try something different. I, it, it just because you're so talented. But anyway, enough. No, no, uh, I, I I totally take the point, and I think about that. It's like the the reward for getting good at something should not be the closing of other avenues. And, and uh, did you, have you had David Epstein on his book range? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I think great book, a totally great book. And I think specialization makes sense, right? Well, the most basic law of economics is the law of comparative advantage, but, but I think uh, range is also important and, uh, and it's, I think fulfilling too. Like, you don't, it, let's say you specialize and specialize, but that specialization is leading to a kind of premature burnout. Then the specialization is actually the enemy of mastery in that sense. Yeah. 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 And I worry about that with you because well, thank you because you look 23, but, um, but that's okay. So l let's, um, Let's talk about the book a little bit. I want to start okay. with the str in a strange place. Um, uh, Queen Elizabeth doesn't get a lot of airtime on Econ Talk. Yes, uh, but she, this her moment has come. Uh, you wrote this book uh, when she was still alive. I, I am pretty sure. Yes, and after it's uh, the book is out, she has passed away. And I have I, I have mentioned her occasionally because I'm not a student of the royal family. I've never been into the royal family. I find it somewhat um, uninteresting until I saw The Crown. I thought The Crown was quite interesting the first couple seasons, less so as, as it progressed. But if you had asked me before The Crown, and if you had asked me before your chapter on Queen Elizabeth, I would say she was a cipher. Yeah. A cipher is a a word doesn't get used much these days. It just means she's a functionary. She's not so impressive. Her mark on the world is small. Um, she is, of course, mainly ceremonial. And I've since, after she's passed away, after watching The Crown, after reading your uh, chapter on her, I I've gained a larger respect for her. And so I want you to talk a little bit, not at too much length, <laughs> but a little bit about what's special, what was special about her. Because again, I think a lot of people, many of them probably listen to Econ, Econ Talk would say, who cares about, I mean, what, why would you pay any attention to her? Well, we should, we should put us, it, it, it's weird to have to put this aside, but put aside the legitimacy or the necessity of the monarchy, right? Because it's a yeah. separate question. Yeah. You know, she doesn't choose whether to be born into this. She doesn't choose whether that should be the, the system of government of, uh, of the country she's born into. She is born into a role, right? She is chosen for a role. And then she uh, chooses to fulfill that role over the next 70 odd years. And, and that in and of itself is impressive. Like I, I opened the book, I, I tell the story of Lou Gehrig, you know, you compare Lou Gehrig's streak to Queen Elizabeth II's streak, and they're not, they're not even in the same ballpark, li literally or figuratively, right? I mean, she showed there, that there are no off days to that job. Um, I, one of my, one of my favorite achievements that I was reading about of hers is that she fell asleep in public or on the job one time in 70 years. And she was in her eighties and it was a lecture about magnets. Uh, <laughs> uh, it just even from a physical perspective, yeah. the, the people who have like her security uh, or the people who will travel with her, like on one trip when she was alive again, would would remark at just the sheer physical toll of the role, which she, uh, to talk about effortlessness, she as a little old lady made you think couldn't possibly be hard. And then you go, wait, she just met 10,000 people in four hours. Like that would be physically grueling in, in the sun, you know? Uh, so, so I, I guess what I what I came to think about her, and I I feel like as I've gotten better at what I've done and gotten older, my my empathy slash respect for professions that I maybe previously would not have had really any admiration for. Clearly, there's a lot of people throughout human history 
have been born into some sort of royal family, right? There are not not a not millions, but this is a long-standing system of of governance of which the, you know those families tended to have. There's lots of people who have had this role, and very few of them have at the end of their life left with any sort of admiration or respect, just like they say the hardest thing to, to do is to leave politics with clean hands. You know, to be, a, to be a royal and to prove yourself worthy, even remotely worthy of the unearned privileges that you got at birth is an extreme accomplishment that we should, you know, we should, we should respect even if we disagree with whether people should get those privileges. Yeah, I want to say two things about her that came to me while reading her book that I really found interesting. Um, you wrote, she always knows more than she says. Yes. And I thought of the um, uh, the line from the Talmud, say little, do much. Mm -hmm. It's good advice. And yes. uh, it, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a powerful um, mantra. The other thing I thought was fascinating, I hadn't thought of until I read your book, was that she was remarkably uninterested in celebrity. Yes. Now you could say, well, oh, no kidding. It was easy for her. But but as as you point out, and, and certainly when you think of her um contemporaries, uh some many years younger than her, but who were on the world stage, uh, they did they spent a lot more time promoting themselves, yes. even though they were very famous. They loved and yearned for publicity. And I think um, I think you said she never gave an interview. Is that correct? She never gave an on the record interview. <laughs> it's like, so that's not the road to fame and fortune. Uh, but somehow, I love the paradox of this. For somebody who spent no time promoting herself, she was unbelievably well known. I, granted, had an advantage. Yes. Queen of England. That's a good starting place. But but the amount, the outpouring of love for her at her passing, partly because of what you just said, that she was managed to leave the job, leave this earth with what appeared to be somewhat clean hands for somebody who, I mean, she's not a very powerful person in a certain right. dimension, another dimension, unbelievably powerful and yes. in the limelight all the time, pretty gaff free. I mean, it's it's an unbelievable Thing And you could argue, well, because she never said anything controversial. I mean, it's easy to criticize. There's plenty of things you can say in the negative. But I think it's just remarkable that her uh, her strategy, and I don't think it was probably wasn't conscious or even intended, turned out to be that by not promoting herself, she really gained a lot of public relations success. <laughs> well, I, I think she embodies one of the interesting elements of discipline at the high level, which is the rigidity actually becomes flexibility or the, the the strength is not in the rigidity, but in the adaptability. So if you look at what the monarchy was in the 1950s to what it is today, it's it's both totally familiar and totally unrecognizable. And yeah. there she had a motto and it comes from some Italian novelist whose name I'm forgetting, but it it, it was if things are going to stay the same, things are going to have to change. And so she had this sense of, well, the institution as a whole needs to uh, remain uh, or, or should remain. My job is to is to protect and uh, uh, prolong it. Um, but I have to be flexible and adjust because the world is always changing. She's she's almost kind of an embodiment of the, you know, of, of the ship of Theseus. Like everything is changed, but it's also somehow the same thing. And to me, there's a lesson in that for all of us. If, if you want to be great at what you do, like I, I, I am a writer. It's a profession that has existed for thousands of years. It's it's not the oldest profession, but it's close to the oldest profession. And uh, yet, what I do is is laughably different than a writer 40 years ago or a writer 100 years ago. Just as the 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 world that I existed in when my book my first book came out a little more than ten years ago, and then hopefully if I'm still doing this decades from now, you you have to have this ability to respect the discipline 
but also be willing to change everything inside the discipline to be able to continue doing it. The other quote I like from her is better not. Yes, yes. We, not a good idea. Let's not do that. And and that, that explain, goes to- Explain that. Well, her, she gets asked to do a lot of things, right? And people have a million suggestions for her. And there are uh, there are a million changes that people do uh, demand of her. And they they kind of have this motto of better not, which to me is the the wonderfully polite British version of just so- no, <laughs> you know, not going to do it. Hard pass. Um, uh, and and so she she has this sense of of what to do and what not to do. And, and that's actually what I opened the book with. There's a, a quote from Epictetus. He's, he's sort of asked to describe at its core what Stoicism is, what the philosophical life, what a, a virtuous life demands. And he says it's two words, persist and resist. So it's this paradox of not doing things and also doing other things and, and knowing <laughs> what those are i mean obviously this now we're in back into the discipline of wisdom but that that strength to do and to not do is is the paradoxical nature of discipline yeah i i um i I disagree a little bit i i don't think probably i really disagree with you but at one point you talk about the power of saying no yes you know and in my book well problems i talk about the the virtue of saying yes sure and of course they're it's a balance. You can't say yes to everything. You don't want to say no to everything uh, because you're going to miss out on some extraordinary things you can't anticipate. So I, as I've gotten older, I've actually gotten better at saying yes. Uh, it's sort of a U-shaped thing. Uh, I think when I was, or M shit, whatever it is, inverted you. When I was younger, I said yes way too much. Yes. Couldn't say no to anybody because you feel like, oh my, I mean, you know, you're, you're insecure and you're vulnerable. And so you say yes a lot. Then you realize, oh my gosh, huge opportunity cost here. I got to say no more. And so you start saying no, and then it feels really virtuous. You t- turn down somebody and you feel really good about it. You sit, you're you staying focused on what you need to do. And then you realize if you're not careful, you say no too often. So anyway. No, no. I think <laughs> about that. I think about that a lot. My instinct is, tends to be to say yes. So I have to cultivate a discipline of saying no, but I, I just got this new thing. It's, it's, it's at a, a frame store being framed, but I've, uh, I, I've fallen in love with Harry Truman, who I'm writing a lot about in the next book. And I, I found this letter, uh, I guess the, the president's just produced so much paperwork. You can, you can buy this stuff relatively cheaply. It was like $500, but it's a, it's a letter. It's a series of memos. So it's all of the memos, but it culminates in this little piece of paper, uh, like an inner office memo at the white house where right after Truman's been elected, uh, I think reelected. Actually, no, this is right after he becomes president. And so uh, his his secretary is writing this inner office memo and it says like, should we say, should we, is the policy that we should start saying no because the president has too many commitments? Uh, and uh, the, the memo makes its way to Truman's desk and he underlines, uh, we must start saying no uh, because uh, the president is too busy. He underlines it, signs it and writes, the correct uh, policy is uh, like is elucidated in this memo, right? And I've got this framed, and it's going to go right next to my desk. Which is the the point is to to say yes to the things that are important: your family, the work you're trying to do, the people you want to connect with, relationships, etc. You have to say no to most things, and uh, even even the sort of serendipitous, fun, crazy experiences that like. You know, let's say your, uh, you know, your decision to to move across the country to take or to move across the globe to have this new job. That's a big yes, but you wouldn't have been in a position to say that yes if you hadn't been disciplined over the course of your career. But also, um, even uh, imagine if you'd taken on so many other big commitments yeah. that it was impossible for you to extricate yourself from them to be able to be in a position to be like. Yes, I want to change my life to do this big thing. It's a great way of saying it, right? You got to say no to allow you to say yes eventually. Yeah, but I'm confused about Harry Truman. So, yes. so what was his verdict on on the memo? So, so it, it, the point was that the secretary was sort of hypothetically, should we start saying no a bit to more things? And he underlines it and is like, yes, we must say no to some. So, <laughs> so I, I, to me, it's this cool document that even like the president of the United States is like. 
like having to put in place policies to create balance. Like, I, I don't know, just that the president signed this thing to remind his secretary <laughs> that yeah. you have to say no. I just, it's just That's so cool. wonderful to me. Yeah, I'm a little worried about your next book, but because you told me you're falling in love with Harry Truman. Uh, you know, here we, in this book, we've got Lou Gehrig, Toni Morrison, George Washington, Antoninus, um, Harry are Truman. You not a, are you know. not a Truman fan? I'm not a big Truman fan. I enjoyed the McCullough biography and I'm glad he created, helped create the state of Israel. So I'm grateful for that. But he's not associated with, when you said love, most people don't see him as a charismatic figure. Interesting. Maybe he's underappreciated. I don't well, so I, I do have, I'm just telling, so basically uh, just, I'm giving away the, the plot of the book, but I'm so excited about it. I love talking about it. So um, uh, the I'm, I'm splitting justice up into sort of three domains. The first of which is sort of personal justice, having like a, a, being a person of honor, having a code of ethics, being honest, being straightforward. And Truman, I, I find to be this fascinating figure in that basically an average person is thrust into uh, the way. White House. And and he does a good job because he was a fundamentally decent human being. He he wasn't this brilliant visionary and, you know, classically trained figure. He was a self-taught sort of Christian man of honor and then thrust into power, manages to do a pretty good job because he has that baseline. But Fair enough. Fair in enough. The, in the, I like in that. The, in the second part of the book, I'm talking about sort of how does one bring justice into the world? And one of the, the chapters I was most excited to write, I talk about um, the proximity to power. One must have a proximity to power to bring good into the world. You can't be this sort of theoretical outsider. And I, I tell the story of Eddie Jacobson, who, uh, who who Truman meets as a young man in, in, in Missouri. He probably never met a Jewish person. And then you flash forward 50 odd years, maybe more, and Eddie Jacobson's the only person who can get a meeting uh, with, with Truman because Truman has decided he doesn't want to hear about Israel anymore. And Eddie Jacobson walks into the Oval Office and uh, he's told by the secretary on the way in to go to our point about uh, controlling that what what has access. He says, "Whatever you do, do not mention Israel to to to, to Truman." And he says, "But that's the only reason I'm here." And and he 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 uh, he he starts to talk to him about it, and Truman shuts him down. And and Eddie Jacobson looks at him and and he says, "I have known you my entire life. This isn't like you, my hero." would like to meet with you to talk about Israel. I need you to do this for me as a friend. And without that personal proximity to power, that lifelong relationship, yeah. Israel might not exist as, yeah, as a country. True. Yeah, that's true. That's a great example. Fair enough. Okay, I take back what I said. It's gonna be a great book. And I'll read it. Uh, All maybe right. I'll come back to you. I would love that. Um, I want to raise a, um, a question I don't think you address in the book about discipline. Ooh which is uh, whether there might be a fixed amount of it. Mm. So uh, you would think that a Jewish person who who's, uh, takes Jewish law seriously and has to forego a bunch of things, uh, pork, shrimp, lobster, uh, Saturday football games, and so on, would be unbelievably disciplined because they've got all this practice at give at foregoing things. So there should be no overweight uh, religious Jews. But I am one slightly. I like to think slightly. And, and there might even be people more overweight than I am. Okay. How is this possible? And it, it it's always um, intrigued me. And I've always wondered whether there's just a limited amount, more or less fixed, but it may be a little elastic of discipline a person can have. So if you acquire it in one area of your life, you have to take up smoking, say, or some 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 um, imperfection, some indulge, I would call it an indulgence. Yeah. Uh, that that the life, the strictures of of that you write about in the book, the relentless uh, self-control is so hard for some people that it's it breaks out in in 
weird. I mean, another an obvious example would be Tiger Woods. Yes. It's a G-rated podcast. We're not going to go into the details. But is there anybody more disciplined in, in, in his craft? Tom Brady is in this, you could argue, there's a handful of people in the world who devoted as much time and focus to what you call the main thing. He had a little trouble elsewhere. He had trouble with self-control. Sure. Uh, is it possible that that, that straight jacket of, of expectations he had placed on himself made it easier for him to stray and, and be undisciplined elsewhere? Well, th there has been some scientific research on this, and I think it, it's 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 both uh, unclear, and then I think it's uh, from a replication standpoint they've struggled. But they would do some experiments where they would like give someone a tough math problem, an impossible math problem, and see how long it would take them to give up on the math problem. And then, so you know, the, let's say the average person does it and quits after ten minutes. Um, they would say, well, how long does an average person last? when they are asked not to eat cookies that are placed on the table in front of them. And they, they tended, I think they tended to find that it, it actually, that, that self, that there was a finite amount of self-control in a person. Um, so I think that that matches the, the sort of, uh, common sense or the, the gut instinct, which is that, yeah, that we have a finite amount of discipline. Uh, and, and yet yeah, the Tiger Woods examples being a good one, the other one being like, Hey, you're on a diet. But that energy go wants to go to some other destructive habit, right? Or somebody somebody quits uh, drugs and then they pick up smoking. That there's sort of like a, an an avenue that the the indulgence has to go through. I think that also kind of um, you know vibes with some common sense. And yet also I think any person who has decided to be disciplined in one avenue of their life finds that it creates momentum or that there's sort of a muscle that comes with it, right? So if if your whole life is chaotic, I think it makes it harder to be disciplined than if you've made some decisions that create order, right? Um, cleaning up your desk to me makes it easier to be disciplined about, you know, the work that you're doing at said desk. Oh, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Said the I, man whose desk looks... Actually, right now it's quite clean, but that's it's an illusion. There's a Flo, there's a Flaubert. Is it? I think it's Flaubert. There's a quote I have in the book that I liked, where he's he's basically saying that you want order in your life so you can have disorder in your creative life, or or you can and and, and I think um, I I think that strikes me as true too. So it's like if I was talking, I I guess my where I come down on this is if I was talking to someone who's like, I have no discipline, I need more discipline in my life. I would probably have them start small. And on the idea that you could build on that discipline, or you could build a life of discipline around these sort of foundational habits. So I, I think it's hard, but the, the, the Jewish question is interesting because I've always been fond of that observation that, um, you know the Jews have kept the the the, the Sabbath, and the Sabbath has kept the Jews. Yeah. I, I like the idea that even though you're observe, like that that the, the the being mastered by a habit or a practice or a rule also creates a kind of self mastery. You know, I, yeah. I think there's something in that that's also true. Yeah, no, I think actually, I think that's right. I, I don't. I think it's wrong that there's literally a fixed amount. But but I do think, I think people differ dramatically in their ability to to self control. Sure. Um, I, I think we've had guests on the program, Katie Milkman, talking about how to change, how to acquire habits. I think most of us are really bad at it. Yes. And if anything, and I'm not convinced that that many of those techniques work. But I will say that I'm more prone to to adopt your insight that a mentor, a disciplined mentor or a disciplined friend, uh, as long as you can not go crazy because they're so good at it and you're a sluggard, uh, a disciplined friend uh, can inspire you and yes. maybe do more for you than mind games that you might play with yourself and so on. Um, I, let me, I'm going to skip to uh, Archie Moore. Uh, this is not the most obscure person in the book, but it's one of the more obscure people. Uh, I am uh, roughly twice your age, and I know who Archie Moore is. 
and I know who Floyd Patterson is. Most people listening will have no idea who we're talking about. They were two boxers from uh, probably the mid 50s, late 50s, or then early 60s for Floyd Patterson. But you have a letter, you quote a letter that Archie Moore wrote to Floyd Patterson that is extraordinary, um, really almost unparalleled is that I that I can think of in, in in the context of how that letter came to be written. And I'd like you to explain what that letter was about. Uh, and I'm curious why you came across that and and, we're, and you put that in your book, because it's pretty obscure. Well, I was I was reading a lot about Muhammad Ali, who I thought might be a character in the book and ended up reading about Floyd Patterson and walked away being much more a fan of Floyd Patterson than Muhammad Ali. And so I read Floyd Patterson's memoir from the 50s. It's called Victory Over Myself, which if, when you're writing a book about <laughs> self-discipline and you see that title, you're like, oh, wow. Uh, so I got very excited. Um, but but Patterson talks about when he loses the, the heavyweight uh, title, He's uh, he, he loses it. Uh, and for basically all of boxing history up until that point, actually for all of boxing history, and then there's only been maybe three exceptions since, uh, when the heavyweight champion would lose the belt, that was it. They never regained it. And so he has this sort of humiliating defeat. He, he was a little overconfident. He wasn't ready. He loses it. And he basically throws himself a pity party. He, he can't get out of bed. He can't look his children in the eye. Uh, and he gets this surprise letter from Archie Moore, who he himself had beaten uh, uh, quite uh, dramatically not long before. And, and Archie Moore basically says, stop feeling sorry for yourself. Uh, you're great. And uh, I think that you can be the first one in history to come back from this and and win. And it's a remarkable letter, I think. And and I again, I was going to write about this more in the discipline book. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about it more in the justice book. But I I love one when somebody does something for someone that you know they they'd owe nothing to. I think that's such a beautiful expression of human greatness. But but when somebody who has been beaten has sort of love or compassion for the person who beat them. That's beautiful. Just as when someone has beaten someone else, what kind of mercy and compassion and love do they have for that person? When there's, when there's the power dynamic and one still does the human, decent, kind, generous thing. And so when you watch someone who could have been resentful, could have been angry, could have been rooting for the failure of the person who had caused failure in their own life to write this letter. I mean, it's just, it's a remarkable act of both ju justice and generosity, but also self-control because he would have had all sorts of competitive feelings for this person. And here he is putting those aside and writing instead a note of great grace and encouragement. Yeah. I've, I've spoken on the program before about how, Athletes in the arena have a certain camaraderie that we can't appreciate. Yeah. Because they know what it's like to be tested and to fail or to te be tested and succeed. Sure. And there was a Patriots played the uh, Packers this past week, and uh, the pa Patriots were big underdogs and they almost won the game. And after the game, uh, there's a moment where Bill Belichick spoke to Aaron Rodgers. We don't know what they said to each other. It, it lasted longer, though, than most of those yeah. encounters. It went for about maybe 20 seconds, 30 seconds. And I know that Bill Belichick respects Aaron Rodgers, even though he had just delivered a horrible, disappointing loss to the team that it, it was it was hanging in the balance and went against the Patriots. And yet I'm sure his respect for Aaron Rodgers is enormous. And he conveyed – I suspect that's what he was conveying to him or, or something. Who, who knows? But but the – most people in that situation of Archie Moore would find it so painful to, to even think about Floyd Patterson, let alone write him a letter. Write him a letter that would be helpful to him after the pain that he endured after losing to him. I mean that's just um, – you know, they're famous examples of this in sports. Um, you know, Bobby Thompson and Ralph Branca – were tied together because of a famous home run that that um, uh, Thompson hit off Branca, and it turned out we found out years later, and it came out that they they cheated 
uh, the Giants had stolen signals from uh, and and had, had an unfair advantage. But they beca- it, they became friends. Yeah, friends. Real apparently, I think it's probably true. Anyway, I, I think it's a fascinating example of that, and um, it does take a lot for somebody to rise above that. Uh, I, I don't want to miss Antoninus. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Antoninus. Antoninus. He is a unappreciated hero that I would suspect most people have not heard of. Give us a thumbnail of why he is someone we should respect. Well, so I write a lot about Marcus Aurelius in my books. He's obviously the sort of main stoic guy. Um, And people don't realize that Marcus Aurelius wasn't born the emperor of Rome or wasn't born to a royal family like we were talking about. It's a remarkable quirk of history. Hadrian, the emperor, doesn't have a male heir. He sees something in this young boy, Marcus Aurelius, but he's too young. So he adopts Antoninus Pius, a man in his 50s, the most powerful politician in Rome at that time, on the condition that he, in turn, uh, adopt Marcus Aurelius. And, you know, Antoninus uh, is basically given this job as a a throne warmer. Um, Hadrian probably suspects he'll live for a few years. Instead, he has a remarkable reign of almost two decades where not a single drop of Roman blood is spilt. There's no corruption. There's no scandals. There's no, uh, it is a flowering moment at the, you know, he's one of the, what we call the five good emperors, which is then culminated in an even rarer feat, which is that he actually trained and prepared a successor for the job. Marcus Aurelius, who has no blood relation to, does a remarkable job. Marcus Aurelius then takes over. And Marcus Aurelius, for all his greatness, is not able to keep that going with his own son, Commodus. And so I I told the story of Antoninus because, you know, one of the elements of self-discipline is that, as we said, because you're not promoting yourself, you're not after, you know, external recognition or rewards that sometimes your your true greatness isn't fully appreciated because it's overshadowed or like uh, as an example August and July are named after the emperor Augustus and Julius Caesar um the Roman Senate offers Antoninus the opportunity to pick a month and name it after himself and, and his wife you wrote <laughs> yes and his wife and so we would we would know who he was today uh, had he taken this honor, but was so indifferent to those things that we don't, just as, you know, talking about Harry Truman, if Harry Truman had called it the Truman plan, probably it wouldn't have passed. But if it had passed, we would be talking about him instead of George Marshall today as one of the great sort of moments of the 20th century. And so part of discipline is that by definition, you are forgoing some of the things that mean so much to people that then become the kinds of stories that we hear and tell about. Like the 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 decision to resist fame makes disciplined people less famous by definition. Yeah. Well, you open the book with a little parable of Hercules facing a choice. Yes. And um I, I you readers can listeners can go read the book, but I, I just want to point out it's very similar to Adam Smith's uh, choice of the attraction of the glittering path versus the virtuous path, the glittering path of fame, wealth, and power, which is very seductive versus the less glittering, less crowded, less uh, appreciated path of wisdom and virtue. Smith takes the argues for wisdom and virtue. Hercules makes the same choice, and uh, that makes all the difference. And it, it turns does. out we've heard of Hercules, and we've heard of Adam Smith, but it could have turned out otherwise. And Antoninus uh, who could have, uh, you know, we could have have had Antober and I don't know what is what was his wife's name? Do you know? I think it's is it Faustina? I, I don't remember actually. Okay, I Faustober. don't know his wife's name. Yeah, Faustover. Um, <laughs> but he for he he. Why did he turn it down? I just don't. I he just wasn't interested in those things. Uh, Amazing. He but he I also. Have, <laughs> go ahead. No, just one footnote, which is crazy. Um, July. One of the things I loved about your book was learning that July is named after Julius Caesar. Yeah. Uh, I guess I, I would guess my mom and dad know that. <laughs> but, I think if you if, if you have a Latin, uh, yes, depending on how much Latin you learn, maybe you pick up on these things or don't. I didn't know that. So in a way, it's kind of ironic 
that Julius Caesar gets this big honor. And now pff, it's forgotten. It's not even hit. Nobody, people, most people don't know that it's July's the end for Julius Caesar. We'll do a poll on Twitter for this. It'll be, uh, or, it'll be interesting. Or, or even think about the fact that put aside the month, uh, Caesar, right? Not only does the emperor, uh, you know, what, what it means to be emperor is named after Caesar, right? Everyone, Caesar. Uh, uh, Kaiser. Is, yeah. But Kaiser and czar exist as terms up until the 20th century. It's true. Yeah. So, you know, crazy. That, that, that the, the lack of discipline to follow the rules, to respect the system that, you know, the desire to make oneself king, the reward is that his name lives on, you know, as an example of power and imperial greatness for, for centuries. Uh, meanwhile, the, the, you know, who remembers the name, I guess, Cincinnatus gets the city of Cincinnati named after him, but not much else. Not bad. Not bad. Yeah. yeah, I hear the chili's good there. Um, sorry, <laughs> can't help myself. Talk about um, mottos. Yeah, uh, I have a couple. I probably have, I don't know, a few. I have a few. I'll just mention a couple that come to my mind when I was reading your book. Uh, I like um, wag more, bark less. Ooh. I like hold your anger for a day. Uh, and I have a couple more like that. And occasionally, not often, but occasionally I remember to think of those and they influence my behavior. And I think those kind of, they're now, people would call them cliches or trite truisms, common sense. Um, I think they're underappreciated. And you have a bunch in your book that I think that I love, you know, wait for the sweet fruit, Um I'm going to just mention one, which we won't explain. But readers can find out. Look at the pottery. I'm going to remember yes. that one. Um, do the hard thing first. Do the hard thing first. Make sure the main thing is the main thing. You have a whole bunch of them. Yeah. You were, I'm sure you spent some time on it. Talk about that and how, if at all, they help you or, or whether you think they're just for fun. No, I, th I think they're very important. And obviously, we've been talking about sports. If you walk into the locker room of any sports team, of any uh, seriousness, what do you find? These sort slogans. of cliches and slogans and rules, you know, on the walls, you know, uh, repeated inside the organization. Like th there's an earnestness in sports to the, to the sort of repetition or worship of these very simple ideas. Um, and there, there's something I think condescending about the way that we dismiss them or laugh at them, you know, just go out there, do your best. You know, it doesn't matter win or lose. It's how you played the game. It, all these things, we sort of laugh at them, but um, in philosophy, there, there's actually a big debate inside the Stoics, inside the, the early Stoics about the benefit of these precepts. Uh, one of the early Stoics thought, no, the wise person should just know. And another one, Seneca said, no, these reminders are helpful. They give us guidance. They, they're they sort of like chorus lines that, that we can come back to. Um, and and I, I think that's true. I mean, I have, they're, they're also book titles for me, but they are reminders that I try to live by. I have the obstacle is the way, stillness is the key, and ego is the enemy tattooed on my arms as reminders that I, you know, always look at. And, and I, as I was finishing the series, I, I have the, the four virtues tattooed here. So I, I think there's an immense amount of value. My office has posters and, and, and quotes. And I, I, I just, I like to see those things up there as kind of reminders or codifications of what I believe and what I'm aspiring to be like. Yeah, it's really interesting. I don't, um, you know, in a way, the greatest compressed version of this is the poem If uh -huh. by Rudyard Kipling. Yeah. And speaking of slogans, uh, you know, it's it's in the Wimbledon locker room about uh, tr about victory and defeat, treating these two imposters just the same. I'm not I'm triumph butchering and the disaster. Line. There it is. Thank you. Say it again. How's it go? Tri Do you know uh, that? Triumph and disaster. Uh, and to treat these two imposters all the same. Yeah, I, I mean, I and I think from a parenting perspective, uh, every, every couple nights, uh, I'll either read that poem to my children or we'll watch a YouTube video where like a really good narrator reads it. And uh, and and they sometimes they like it, sometimes they don't. But I do hope it's worming 
its way through their muscle member or you know into their into their DNA. Yeah, Michael Caine reads that poem, and I love Michael Caine's voice. So, but I think he reads it differently than Kipling wrote it. Just for the record, yeah, and and I think he reads. I think he learned it from his father. And I remember th- there's, we'll put a link up to that. Um, it, it's, it's a little different and I, and I'm not sure it's a, an error. I think it's a, an, an edit, but that's the, for an, another question. The most heartbreaking poem, if you have read, uh, if, uh, the follow-up is his poem, my boy, Jack, have you read that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, sure. And, uh, I think about that often. I, I do this other email I, I do every day called Daily Dad. And I wrote this poem about how, you know, the tragedy of Kipling is that his poems celebrating imperialism and war and all these things. Manly cashing, virtues. Yeah, it, it, it's cashing, it's writing a check that he pays for with his son's life. And it's a reminder to me that as parents, we have this sort of responsibility to think about the consequences of our policies, our beliefs, our, you know, the, the people we elect, our children pay those bills. And there's something so, you read the beauty of that first poem, If, where he's giving all this advice to his son. And then, you know, at 19 or 20 years old, his son is cut, cut down in, in France. Actually, more than cut down, there's not even enough of his son left to bury him. They, 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 they weren't even sure where he was buried for a very long time because he was essentially vaporized in the trenches. And uh, there is there is something immensely moving and tragic about if when you think about it that way. And he has a short story that is astounding. I have forgotten the name of it. I, if someone out there knows this, um, the story where he tries to imagine, uh, it's a mystical story about re-encountering his, his not so much his son, but news about his son. It's an amazing story, and I've forgotten it now, and wow. someone out there knows about it. I appreciate it. Let's close talking about parenthood. Yes. Um, it's, it's a big issue in, in my new book. Um, I argue – you could argue that my book is too pro-parenting or too pro-marriage, uh, and I guess I would justify that saying that our culture has reduced the appeal of those things a great deal. And so in some sense, my my book is a little bit of a corrective. My book's not about marriage and children alone. It's about other things, but it's a central part of the of, of the book is discussing those those two things. And and although I recognize they have many downsides, I I, may, I talk a lot about the upsides. Um you suggest in your book that child in the end in your afterward and and that children have um, shaped you in certain ways. Can you talk about that? Well, Having I, children. They, they certainly challenge your discipline in a lot of ways, uh, right? Um, but we were talking about saying no earlier. I think one of the, the big things that shaped me was realizing that when I was saying yes to the things I say yes to, again, somebody else pays that bill. Right. So the decision to go out of town to attend this conference or to go on this cool trip or to go to this meeting, you know, that means I'm not picking my son up from school or that means I'm tired in the afternoon and I can't do X, Y or Z. And so I I think, you know, one of the things that parenting or the decision to become a parent does is it it's a very powerful constraint on your life, I think, in a way that's positive. It's like it's sort of a, a a direction or a channel that that forces you to think about where all these things are going. You don't have unlimited time. You can't have whatever schedule you want. It just it forces you. I mean, it forces you to become an adult in so many ways. That's not doesn't force you to become an adult. It should make you an adult if you are taking the obligations and the responsibility of it seriously. You know, and so I, yeah, I think I think it's changed me in a lot of ways. Almost all of which are positive. And when people say, "Oh, it'll hold me back," I say, "Yeah, it probably will." But it may also hold you back in reality. Like it may tie you to planet Earth or to some sort of connection to other people or things. I mean, like when I when I think about 
you know, oh, I want to be a digital nomad. I travel around. I don't own anything. I'm a minimalist. You know, these sort of things that we have come to celebrate in the last decade or so, there is something very lonely and ephemeral and disconnected about all of it. And it's the opposite of what I think virtue and duty are about. My guest today has been Ryan Holiday. His book is Discipline is Destiny. Ryan, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you for having me. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.